welcome everybody, dear guests. And uh, I have to admit, I'm still overwhelmed uh, that we can today sit and talk uh, with Svetlana Alexeyevich. I was preparing this event since a certain time. Oh, also, the Russian channel is which number? 25. I was uh, preparing uh, this event uh, with uh, colleagues and assistants uh, since um, a certain time, and um, yes, we were not wrong. Uh, Svetlana, I think um, you are, as a writer and as a woman, a gift to the European continent. I think um, what you see here, uh, this uh, crowd, which is really different from the normal Brussels bubble, uh, this crowd shows how much people love in Europe what you do, how, love they much, the, how much they love your work. And my assistants, when they came to me yesterday evening with the last list of accreditations, uh, they gave me a very impress impressive detail on this uh, event. They told me we will have people from more than 50 countries. So your work is obviously very important uh, for this European continent, uh, but it's also very important for the rest of the world. And why do I think that your books are such a gift for us? The first book I read by Svetlana was the book on Chernobyl. Yeah, as a green, as an anti-nuclear campaigner, uh, this makes sense. Yeah, but uh, I think this book really helped many people to recognize man-made disasters and our common responsibility for these disasters, be it nuclear disasters or be it the war. Many of your books also are telling us about wars and people in war. And when I read Second Hand Time, I think what I understood um, for me, I hope it's a bit similar for everybody else, is this book really helps to bridge gaps in between the East and the West of this continent. And uh, I'm also convinced that it's so important because it's not about our nations, uh, but it's about people. I think uh, what mainly I'm profiting from uh, when I read uh, Second Hand Time, and it's one of those books you, you must read more often than only once, but when I read Second Hand Time, um, I think that this book really helps on this continent to see each other uh, in a so a uh, real better light, uh, and it's quite necessary regarding all the new tensions uh, in between the East and the West and uh, tensions uh, caused by uh, new attraction uh, so for more authoritarian leaders, not only in Russia, but also outside of Russia and even uh, in the West or what we called the West so far. So how comes that we are um, out of the Brussels bubble? I think really it's Svetlana, so attractive, but I have in the very beginning of this meeting, I have to thank people who contributed uh, to escape the normal Brussels bubble in the European Parliament. Uh, first of all, I have to thank uh, President of the European Parliament, Mr. Tajani, 
who uh, decided uh, that the European Parliament uh, is uh, taking the patronage uh, of this event. Thank you, Mr. Tajani. I have to thank my colleague uh, Sandra Kalniete. So the two of us sometimes were thinking whether we would be able to deliver uh, the quality of event which uh, Tatiana deser Svetlana deserves, but um, I think it worked. Thank you, uh, Sandra. I have to thank um, my assistant Sabine in a very a special way, and uh, also Bagdana from the EPP group, uh, these two, uh, but also the teams of the offices, uh, Harms and Kalniete, contributed a lot. Uh, I have to thank my group, the Green Group, for the live stream, because uh, many people can follow us uh, in this event uh, on the live stream. And I have to thank Jean Janiot and the Pen Club of Belgium and uh, Pen International uh, because um, they also, uh, I think, uh, with their public relation, uh, their good connections uh, in uh, so the sphere of uh, culture in Brussels, uh, they helped us uh, to make the event known. And uh, thanking you means in the same time to pass the floor now to Jean. Merci. Merci, Rebecca. C'est un, un grand... Thank you very much, Rebecca. It's a pleasure for Penn International and for Penn Belgium, which is the centre that I've been representing for a year now. So on behalf of Penn Club, I'm particularly touched and moved and honoured to open this session with one of the most eminent figures of modern literature, but also of contemporary consciousness. She uh, makes sure that her polyphonic novels resonate with uh, the uh, shattered utopia of Soviet socialism and the cosmic disaster that was Chernobyl. This made our world dive into the unknown. Now, in order to move us like this, of course, there is a sensitive writing, genuine, uncompromising, without any special effects, but also it is based on testimonies. She listens to people and she really transfigures, literally, all of these testimonies in her books, and that makes her a real writer. This means that she has a universal outlook on the world. Throughout her works, she has really defined literature, and she has given a highest uh, uh, meaning to the function uh, of literature. Now, when she received the Nobel Prize, she said the following. Well, here, we don't have a right to invent. We have to show the truth just as it is. We need the sort of lit literature that goes beyond writing literature. It is a testimony that needs to talk. Now, if we see that... Uh, your work really embodies the vocation of Pen Club. It is because you are dedicated and free. What is the vocation of Pen Club? Well, it is an association which is soon becoming 100 years old. It was created in 1921 by a woman, and it has a double goal, to uphold literature as a common um, inheritance of... Um, Humanity, literature here being intended in its largest sense, it goes beyond what um, the acronym poets, playwriters, editors, essayists, novelists, and non fiction writers that's what the word pen, the acronym pen means. So here we really see that we go beyond all of that. Penn wants also to uphold the principle of free circulation of ideas amongst nations. 
Each of its members, whether writers or non-writers, have a duty, which is to oppose any restriction to the freedom of expression. And you, madam, together with 60 other writers, because you resigned from Penn Russia, you stood up with 60 other colleagues against the apathy, the incapacity of Penn Russia, who did not want to support the release of Oleg Stentov, who was condemned at uh, uh, 20 years of imprisonment. You know, he was... Uh, a resident of Crimea, and he was, uh, he had to take the Russian nationality. So the writers in uh, Pen Ru of Pen who left Pen Russia created in St. Petersburg an association for the freedom of the world, Zvobodonye Slovo. And I'd like to say loud and clear that Penn International is explicitly supporting um, these, uh, uh, this association and the Penn Club will uh, say it again during the 84th Congress, World Congress, which will be taking place in the Ukraine uh, during the fall. We hope that you will be there. Um, throughout your books, you tell a moving story from individual stories, uh, you come up with a fresco of uh, n n and a narrative about the history honoring the memory of all these victims in an uncompromising way. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, to continue something what I had forgotten because I tried to shorten myself, I have to say welcome also uh, from the sphere of culture to the Académie Royale et leur président. Uh, L'Académie royale de la littérature ici en Belgique, um, c'est très bien. So the uh, Royal Academy of Literature here in Belgium, it's a very good thing that you accepted to come join us here in the Parliament. Of Lithuania, also showing that this is kind of specific meeting. Uh, I welcome colleagues from Ukrainian Parliament, uh, Ukrainian ambassador. Uh, I welcome uh, also colleagues uh, from uh, Parliament in uh, Belarus. Uh, I know that also Russians are here. So among those uh, 50 um, countries uh, represented in this room, I think it's uh, of crucial importance uh, that also Russians, citizens of Belarus and Ukrainians are present. I know that even we have uh, some interns from the European Parliament, Ukrainians from Crimea, Crimean Tatars. So I think um, it's um, clear uh, that many people want to listen to you and when we thought uh, with uh, your uh, friend and agent Galina Dursthoff how to do it, she said, ask her questions. Um, would you say something before a question or would you like to receive immediately a question? <laughs> Uh, I think uh, I can take uh, a few moments and say a few brief words. Uh, indeed, I see um, a lot of different people, people of different epochs, different time, people who lived during the Soviet times. And Dostoevsky, as he said in his um, work, a teenager, we are all people coming from uh, from crazy time, from some frenzy. We are people from different worlds. And, of course, there are young people present, people who, young people who were born in an entirely new world, new time. And, of course, it will be interesting for me just to answer your questions. You can imagine how many speeches I, I held, how many... Uh, press conferences I uh, gave. Let's build our discussion as questions and answers. 
I've been doing my um I've been doing this work my whole life. What what is my work? My work was to study the most important ideas of the 20th century. Uh, to study socialism or even Bolshevism and fascism. These are two uh, very powerful ideas that have transcended a whole century and are still alive now. And uh, I studied and I looked at these ideas through the prism and through the eyes of a small, ordinary person. And there are, of course, I mix it with my memories of my childhood memories. I see a lot of my compatriot, uh, compatriots from Belarus. I love Belarus. And when I was a child, I grew up among them. I grew up among ordinary, small people. I remember my grandmother, those beautiful Ukrainian ladies who sang folk songs, who were wearing traditional dresses. Um, and I remember it very, very well. My memories are very vivid. And my childhood memories are very, very strong. And my parents, who were village teachers, um, they had a lot, a lot of books in their house. But what was happening in the street always interested me more. We only, there were only old men and women in our villages and only very, very few men. And uh, my father was uh, the village school director. And what I remember is that our women were discussing war, were talking about war, but not just about war, about love as well. Both themes were mixed. They were talking about love, about how their husbands or boyfriends courted them, but at the same time they would immediately uh, speak about wars, about many faces of evil. And for a child it was a tremendous, tremendous shock. It left a very, very strong impression. And not a single book afterwards, even my favorite Dostoevsky, has never um, has never shaken my soul to such an extent as those simple stories of ordinary people did. I tried to express it in my books, but it took me a lot of time to understand and figure out why it, it was like this. And I understood that suffering is also a form of expression, of providing information, but information that is being transmitted in a different language because a, everyone, a person, adds something from his own soul. In, the, in my books, I obviously stylized it in a certain way. I edited it in a sense to make it uh, so, to sound it properly. But I tried to get across a word that would be alive, that would touch people, move people. And that was the red line that was going through my whole life, through my work. When I started writing books, I have decided that I will write about domestic socialism, not about the socialism that we perceive as this monster, uh, rivers of blood, uh, summary, graves, mass graves. I've been to Siberia. I know that those bones stick out of the Siberian soil. But I wanted to write about a human soul. And I wanted to understand the workings of the Soviet soul. Why there are people who belong to the Stalin area, to the Lenin area, to the Soviet times, and nowadays to Putin times. They, some of them seem to be alien, but I wanted to understand what 
makes them these kind of people? How to withstand certain temptations and challenges of time? How and why sometimes society gives in to unreasonable frenzy? I visited many places recently and I could feel a different breath of society. I heard different words, different expressions, different superstitions. And each time it uh, makes a very, very strong impression on me. And I was, it fascinates me how many, how can it happen that so many people can suddenly be taken over by a mass frenzy, by a huge mass uh, movement. I've read a lot about Nazism, about fascism, and uh, about the events in the Nazi Germany, and that is also one of the subjects that interests me. Dostoevsky has been, um, was writing of how much human there is in a human being, and that is something that always interested me how to be a human, how to be a, a human being. It is so difficult, it is so hard. And each time, each period of time brings to us new challenges, new trials. In the Soviet times we've been living without any fear, without any apprehension that there would be a, a revolution, that there will be a new war. But it all happened to us. Uh, including the same superstitions, the same errors. Why? Why did communism that we were bearing in the 90s with such great joy, why does communism live on? And why is it picking up its head and looking at us from the corner of history? Just recently in Moscow, I saw that the, um, that the monument to Dzerzhinsky that I saw lying on the ground is already put upright, and Dzerzhinsky is ready to take a step forward, to move on. Where to? I don't know. Why and why in the places of work of Stalin, wherever Stalin went, why those places are already commemorated with a special plaque. Why? So to answer this question, what is the most important in the history of Russia? The first we have Stalin, then Putin, and then Pushkin. So Pushkin has somehow made it into the first three. Why does it happen? Why does it repeat itself in our history? That is the question that I ask myself. And if it is something that interests you or any of us, I will be happy to answer your questions. Perhaps somebody, some of you have read my books. I'll be happy to answer your questions. I would like uh, to answer a question, and um, it fits uh, a bit uh, to what have what has been said by you, Svetlana. Um, I think um, what I feel is uh, that uh, your concept of looking uh, for um, the soul of the people is um, the opposite of the concept uh, which is followed uh, by uh, politicians like uh, Trump or Putin. They want to make they are nations great again. And what I feel in your books is uh, that your idea is to make the people great by simply listening to them and making them heard. When I read your books, I'm always asking myself, because I, as a politician, I know that it's sometimes not easy to go close to the people. Yeah? It's really, it, it requires a lot of strength. And I'm wondering, uh, what is this strength? Uh, because even if you write uh, sometimes things 
which are very critical then also in the reflection on those mm -hmm. small people, it feels as if you would love everybody. Actually, I would love to be able to love everyone, but it's a tall order. I believe that at the very beginning, it was due to my young age, because I didn't know what was lying ahead of me. I couldn't even suspect what was ahead of me. I couldn't even imagine how great and at the same time terrible human beings are. However, I heard it all. I went from one house to another, and sometimes I would hear things that shocked me, and then I would hear something that would terrify me. For instance, I heard a woman who was a driver at the war, and she recalled that close to Stalingrad there were a lot of dead bodies. There were so many dead bodies that a horse could not make a step forward because she, the horse couldn't step on the dead bodies. And I was driving my Studebaker, and I heard those skulls cracking. And I, and she was happy to hear that. And I was really terrified to hear that, because I didn't have the right to judge her, because the Nazis had burned their children. And I knew that I couldn't judge her, but at the same time, this terror that had been concocted by the humans in our world, and when another human becomes happy when she hears the crack of the German skulls. That was something, it was hard to swallow. I, I'll be frank with you, quite often I had this temptation to give it all up, but when it comes to evil, it has this hypnotizing facet. At the same time, the same evil is something all too human, because it's our way of cognizing things, because unfortunately, it's not just through happiness and harmony that we cognize the world around us. There are wars, there are barricades. Harmony and happiness, they happen in a different age. And perhaps for them we'll look like some barbarous tribe. But when it comes to evil and the depth of evil, they make us come back to our senses and actually go back to the normal way of development. Sometimes it's a step too far. There, it's beyond the point of return. And then evil has tracked humans. And it's terrible. Of course, I don't perceive myself as a superwoman. I recall a situation when I was writing the book entitled The boys in sync. It was about the war in Afghanistan. And so I was brought to an exhibition of the military equipment taken from the Mujahideens. Well, when I went in, I was fascinated by the beauty of these weapons. They were beautiful and terrifying at the same time. And so beauty and death, these are two facets of the same coin, if you will. And I told a colonel who was accompanying me, wow, it's terrible how much human time and effort had been given to produce this beauty that is killing other people. And the colonel told me, and that was next to an Italian mine, it was painted yellow and red. And he told me out of the blue, you know what this beauty is all about? And as a military man, he explained to me that if you step on this beauty of yours like this, then it will be just a half bucket of human flesh. That's it. Several days later, he called me. I was staying at a hotel that belonged to the general staff. And he told me, Madam, are you willing to go with me and see what happened 
to a human being once he encountered this beautiful mind. Well, I know that men distrust women, especially when it comes to a front line. So, I was at a dilemma, shall I go or not? But I am a Russian woman after all. I belong to the Russian culture. If you want to write about something, you need to know it. You need to go the whole nine yards. You need to understand and see clearly what you are writing about. The temperature outside was about plus 50 Celsius, but still, I went outside. Again, I don't take myself as a superwoman, but I saw human flesh scrapped. And that's the leftovers of the boys that were killed by this mine. And of course, I collapsed. I fainted. Why was that? It's not for human consumption. And then, when I went back home, when I was transcribing all my tapes, shall I write about it or not? Of course I should. Of course I have to write about it. People have to know about it. The devil needs to see a mirror so that he doesn't think that he doesn't exist. And so many times I would listen to the tapes and listen over and over again to what I'd recorded. But I don't believe that at this juncture I would be able to go back where I went to when I was just 40. And I went to a ward where there were boys with no legs or no arms, and they didn't want to go back home. And at home, their lonely mother couldn't be waiting for them either because she didn't know what to do with this amputee. At this juncture, I wouldn't dare to enter that ward because my protective mechanism wouldn't be sufficient to withstand this. What am I saying? I'm trying to tell you that this knowledge, it's, you have to pay a lot for that. But what is most important is that when you are writing, you think, you always try to gauge, do other people need to know about it or not? But my belief was, and perhaps I was wrong, at least I was under the impression that I should write about it. Because if people don't know about it, then they will forget very quickly what they have gone through. For instance, when women who had gone through war told me about the last day of the war, when they were out of munition, they had no bullets left. And they thought that after they'd been through, people wouldn't be able to kill each other anymore. Unfortunately, they were wrong. And then there's another question. Is art that strong? Can art stop people from killing other people or from doing other terrible things? Each my new book is about a new question and an attempt to answer that question. Svetlana Aleksandrovna, uh, we have shared common both are coming from Soviet Union and we have seen uh, the glorious moment of destruction of the Soviet Union with all the hopes and also later on with all the deceptions. And I would love to ask you about how you work. But before I will get to that question, I still want to ask a political one. Uh, going through history of, of Russia, there always is a presence of strong trust in good Tsar, the one who knows, who will lead, who will guide, who will resolve, who, uh, who will help, which is um, really a belief in supreme, the power of supreme authority which is absolutely necessary in the life of that Malinki Chevarek you are writing about. And looking to Soviet period again, that was strong vertical construction with Stalin on top, who was the father of the nation. And now again, we are witnessing another construction with Putin in the top. And my question is with some provocation to you. Do you think that 
that concept of supreme authority, which is such a necessity for, uh, for Malinki Chilevek in, in, in Russia and, uh, and also in, in most probably in Belarus, it has its roots in, in the concept of Eastern Christianity. Well, I believe that when it comes to Russia or the entire space that was dominated by Russia, it's been like this all the time. It's applicable not just to Soviet time. It was back in the Tsar on top of the pyramid. You had a good Tsar or a bad Tsar, and it was up to the Tsar to decide on everything. Pushkin writes about it in Boris Godunov. So the people are silent. The people always await what the Tsar says or does. But what is the authoritarian power, the Soviet power? Again, we go back to the Tsar just under a different name. It's called the Secretary General. Today we hear the President as a name to this. But the experience of freedom freedom that would be spread in the air of the entire society when this freedom is not just what the Tsar told you to do but the freedom has materialized into life freedom has become the mechanics of life and that's why when President Trump was elected the first thought that occurred to many, including myself, was as follows. Now all the hopes are on the checks and balances, on the democratic principles of the United States. Will it stand this trial? What will be the outcome in this face-off? Who will take over? It's never happened like this in the Russian history. And here I'm referring to Russian history because it's the dominating theme for the entire Slavic space that I'm aware of, and I stem from this space myself. But there is no knowledge like this. Okay, they use words like freedom or democracy, but the content of these concepts is different. Freedom is will, liberty, if you will, democracy, well... Still, there is somebody at the top who makes a decision and then the rest just adheres to that decision. So we still lack this experience of living in a free society and that's exactly why the reconstruction, perestroika, came to a halt and collapsed. And that's why moving from one age to another resulted in a totally different, unexpected result. I recall going back to Moscow three years ago. I hired a cab. And I told the cabbie, all right, so how is life here? And he asked me, well, we've been trying to build capitalism under the guidance of KGB. Well, this is a very perceptible remark on the part of an ordinary person because all the guidelines have been lost. After socialism, no one expected that capitalism will come in its place. I think everyone was dreaming of a capitalism or maybe even about socialism with a human dimension. This was the ultimate dream. But then they started scattering the entire pie into pieces. It was up for grabs. So freedom is maybe emerging now. Only now we see in Ukraine how dear this aspiration for freedom costs. We also see that people who went to Europe to study, the younger generation who have been educated in Europe, when they go back, they bring their own aspirations with them, of course, provided that they come back then they know what freedom is about and now it needs to be implemented. But unfortunately, they are not exactly wanted there. 
So as a result, the romanticism that was in place back in the 90s when we were really hoping that next day there will be freedom. So we got on a bus and next stop is freedom. Well, now we hear that, and I hear it from my democratic friends, we left the squares where we were protesting too early. We trusted Yeltsin too much. We didn't know that we shouldn't be trusting another person. We should be checking what other people are doing. We lack culture of building something. All we have is a culture of a struggle. It's only dawning on us now. We just start addressing topics like this. And that is why when it comes to dormitories, to university dorms, our new generation of students is arguing about something very new. So in Belarus I didn't ask that, but I said, look, which country is your ideal country? Do you want to live in a great country like Russia or the Soviet Union, or would you prefer living in a normal country like Denmark or Sweden? I'll tell you what, 80% opted for living in a great country. That's how close the past is to the present, because we tend to be optimistic. We say, well, it's a new generation. They speak two, three foreign languages. But this new generation told me that they would prefer living in a great country. And they feel ashamed. They feel embarrassed when they go to Europe. They feel humiliated. So that's the entire set of the ethics of the power, of the force, of violence. It cannot evaporate overnight. For instance, take Belarus as a case in point. Textbooks have remained the same. If they have been rewritten, still the idea of strong power is in place. It's a leitmotif, if you will, of all the textbooks. So I really don't know, but I think that there is a lot of work to be done. Understanding this is uh, also for us, uh, and I, I put myself always still into the Western bag yeah, in the European Union, it's for us a very important issue, what we are touching right now, because so traveling often from uh, Brussels uh, to the east, uh, to um, uh, Kiev, uh, to Donetsk region, uh, to Chisinau, uh, soon also uh, to Georgia, uh, to Romania, to Poland, to Lithuania, uh, to also include some of the uh, member states uh, from more the eastern angle of the continent. Um, I know for you it's the center, and I agree <laughs> when we are talking about the map, uh, but for me it feels mm -hmm. still to travel uh, to the east. So I'm traveling from the west to the east, from the east to the west, and mm -hmm. so, so on. And um, I know that we are all living in the year 2017. Uh, but uh, very often, especially when I'm traveling uh, to the front line in Ukraine, but uh, also if I'm traveling into the countryside in Eastern Europe, I do not feel that we really live all together in the year 2017. And um, when I saw that your book was named uh, Second Hand Time, uh, I asked myself, how does she see this? These uh, so different times or eras uh, we are still in, and it's even worsened, I would say, because my impression about the role of Putin is that he is really trying to stop the clock and to turn back the time so that it's even more difficult to arrive in the same time with all the people in the continent. You see, this is a very sharp perception. It is true that we live in different time. 
And uh, I think that, indeed, if you go to Iran, for example, or Afghanistan, there you will, people live in an entirely different epoch. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan, things look completely different. But what is important? Who are we? We are all a collection of ideas. And time, what is time? Time is a, a movement, a movement of human ideas. And uh, my feeling is, my impression is that the time may not necessarily go forward. It was a revelation for me. A time can really move backwards. Indeed, there are times when time goes back. What is fascism? What is the time of, of fashion? That was the moment when time was working backwards. And uh, afterwards, 40 years hence, uh, after the tragedy that had happened, they, they were finally ready to start talking about time. But until that time, they couldn't do it because uh, uh, new people had to come who would have a different mindset. I like uh, our Russian author Andrei Platonov, who used to say that not young people, he used to call them fresh time, new time. That's the term he used to use for young people. So you have to wait for this new time. And uh, uh, what you are doing in uh, our part of Europe uh, perhaps uh, you could accelerate this time, but how difficult it is. Probably uh, we are not meeting your expectations, I'm afraid. Uh, what I will wanted to say is that uh, there are new cars going... Uh, uh, in our streets, Bentley luxury cars, new different collection of clothing, new weapons, new armaments, tanks, and uh, all kinds of missiles. But um, the people are not that new. They have a heavy baggage of the old past. It's uh, not so easy to jump from one time into another, a new Imagine the tragedy of Obama. He thought that his country, that America and he himself were living in one time, but he was disappointed. And I can imagine what Gorbachev felt when he saw the uh, basically destruction, the deterioration of, of his ideals when he's currently being called a traitor, a criminal, and um, a lot of people hate him. You see, this, um, this whole concept is not so easily predicted. And uh, various expert communities um, see more and more failures because this knowledge, this expertise, is, um, proves false. The time is different, fears and um, concerns are different. Look back 30 years ago. Imagine what were people's dreams at that time. Did they know about ISIS or terrorism, about Chernobyl tragedy? Chekhov used to write in his um, plays, sisters, uh, one of the sisters, uh, or probably, no, one of the male characters says, in 100 times the future will be beautiful, people will be wonderful. And what did we see 100 years later, the uh, Second World War, the Chernobyl catastrophe, and the present day world? You see, yes, there are dreams that people dream, and there is reality. And the connection between the two and with our mentality, with our consciousness, is not so, um, is not so obvious. 
Our mentality is a thing that is difficult to perceive. It's irrational and is difficult to understand and explain to it, especially with the Russian, with the rational, in rational terms. So I would say that the world is unpredictable. But what is obvious is that we are all trying, people are trying, and they wish to move forward. But you can see the resistance, the resistance that the process of globalization is facing, of uh, that the multicultural initiatives are facing. Talk to a Russian person, and the first thing he would tell you is that oh, all those Europeans are fools. Why fools? Why are they, why are they uh, opening their doors to those refugees? Why are they feeding them, giving them a place to live? And you understand that that person is living in an entirely different world, in a world completely different from a European world, where ideas that, uh, or where it's hard for people to imagine to do something just out of compassion, not out of self-interest not because of some European, common European values and ideals. It's, it surprises me, it's shocking. But I see those Soviet people uh, everywhere, in Austria, Germany, uh, the United States, and these people say the same things, if, despite the fact that they've been living in Europe for decades. Somehow this world, uh, some, somehow they live in a uh, in, in different dimension in the material world at the let's say at the level um, of camembert cheese something they've carried from the world of violence and keep it within themselves when i'm being asked especially young people in russia when they ask me in uh, russia or in moscow in in uh, the google center for example when they ask me uh, what what is there to do? And I answer him, you have to decide what to do. You have to take this decision. You have to give impotence and dimension to your life. You have to uh, make a choice what to believe in. And you have to bear in mind that our religion is a, you can you can say it is a fairly totalitarian religion right a, a, a human being is is here on earth but god is above he decides a human fate and i realize that all our problems are fundamentally cultural that shows you how deeply culture is ingrained in human mentality. We publish millions of books. My books were published in the Soviet Union uh, uh, with a circulation of uh, millions. So did they change anything? So what? It hasn't become a part of people's convictions. Those books, those ideas uh, broadcast million, in millions of books. You see, you need to have time. You have to have convictions. And my ideas, this is a condensed time, condensed time of my parents, of my time. It, well, now I'm, I'm, I, I almost look like I'm giving a lecture. But, of course, I, can, I do not know everything myself. La, la, la littérature évoquée le... Thank you for uh, uh, everything you said. Uh, um, you created a new uh, literary genre. When we read your book, we realize that for everything that has been mentioned, be it the uh, disaster of Chernobyl and uh, the boys in zinc, uh, the war in Afghanistan, or the little man, as you said, for all of this, you felt the need to use a new language, a language that comes from the words that you are trying to give back to the people uh, that you met, and the people who you've met and who uh, told you about not the big concepts of society, but the details of their day-to-day -day lives. 
you have mentioned uh, three names. The three uh, names that uh, Russian people mention when they are asked about the big personalities, and. In a way, it is a good thing that Pushkin is one of them. We know that Russian literature is fed by literature and a taste for literature. So my question is the following. F to describe this new world, world, you needed to invent a new um, literary genre uh, that was already started by Alice Adamovich. Um, who um, was your uh, professor. But in order to develop this new literature and this new education and culture, should we also maybe all create um, a new motivation for reading? Should we give the taste to people to delve into something slow and deep, such as a book, something that is less direct than television or current media, something that takes more time but that can open your eyes in another way. When mentioning uh, Stalin and Putin, I would have expected Chekhov to be uh, mentioned. He um, also made an experience that is similar to the one that you made. He was uh, initially a doctor, and I was wondering if your listening to those people does not fundamentally come from the heart. Well, I think heart, what comes from, from the heart, means a lot. But I think I, I listen to my reason more. Why? I think that um, lit the task of, of literature, the objective, is to set a human being free from banality, vulgarity of life. There are so many superfluous works. I, I don't even mention mass media and so on. There is enough banality and vulgarity in his world. Vernadsky used to say that this superfluous upper layer, this atmosphere is filled with banalities. It's uh, overwhelmed by banality. And uh, I think the uh, objective of uh, literature is to find new ideas, explanations. Uh, when I'm working on a book, on my book, and of course I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, say that I'm the author of this genre. No, all our literature, Russian literature, Belarusian literature, it all has uh, those elements that I use. Sofia Fedorchenko, for example, in the First World War writer, she used to record, uh, record um, conversations with soldiers. And my teacher, Ales Adamovich, used the same method. I uh, adapted this method a little bit. And I was searching for it for a long time. So what's left of our life? What's left is a word. What kind of word? Only the word that that can only a new word that hasn't been known yet. And we have to dig deep and find that new knowledge in human soil, soul, and those who succeed in that, they uh, can understand those huge epic processes that are going on. The word of a witness, a testimony of a, vi of a witness, is very important. It's like uh, a confession of love. It's something that is born within a human heart um, it's a pure feeling. It is unpolished. It is unedited. It is raw. And this is what I'm looking for, if I may say it. I'm searching. I'm chasing it. Um, and indeed, I often uh, cite Flaubert 
if uh, a person is uh, if you can compare a person uh, with um, a pen i can compare myself with a human ear because i'm trying to listen i try to hear these changes i remember uh, for example a, a, a man of uh, of the 90s is a romantic looking forward to new life, new future. Now it is a disappointed uh, cynic. And I can't even imagine what can bring people to uh, come and protest um, uh, squares. Maybe, maybe if a UFO arrives, then people will uh, head to the streets. But what else? What can make them believe? What can they believe in? What preachers can they believe? Can they believe in themselves? I don't think so. People don't need preachers or anyone else. The whole purpose of life has become um, for them or has focused um, just like as a living. I often ask young people, where have you been? In a bar. What were you doing there? I was just sitting in a bar. But were you doing anything? You couldn't have just been sitting in a bar doing nothing. I was just sitting there. I was living there. My la And I asked, but were you thinking of something? I went to the bar in order not to be thinking about anything. That's that's a completely different approach, approach to the values of life. For my generation, the values were books, uh, knowledge, learning, poetry. Now it is click, click, click culture, right? We can, a click civilization, we can say. You click and you are taken somewhere in a new reality. People nowadays... On the one hand, live more easily because they have access to anything, knowledge or anything, but that does not prevent them from writing banal things. I often um, go and read uh, to certain Internet sites and read uh, stories of human lives. It is a catastrophe. It is a disaster. Uh, why I read those things on, on those sites? Because I'm writing a book about love right now, and I'm looking for my future characters there. Um, and it's so difficult to catch, to seize this human element in a person, because it's all is hiding behind banal and vulgar thing, things. It is much more difficult to find the human soul nowadays than it was in the Soviet times, when things were more clear and more easy to understand what to do and who who is your enemy, who is your friend. Things were simpler then. Now truth and uh, lies are all uh, intertwined. It's a post-truth world. Uh, quite recently, one one of my Italian acquaintances who uh, who studies uh, Russia and who actually gave up on uh, Stalin, gave up on the Pope, and gave up on myself. Um, and he 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 called me to inquire whether I was still alive, and I just told him I am alive because he couldn't actually find this information. He couldn't distinguish between lies and truth in mass media. We need to form intellectual resilience and strength to withstand all those challenges. May I continue on the, the subject what, uh, what you just began? It's true. Uh, there is... Um, uh, today we really have need to be uh, strong and analytical and independent to choose uh, the right way to make the right choice. Uh, 
the difference between Soviet time and today, that today the choice is mine, but in Soviet time, the choice most, in most occasions were made instead of me. And I practically had no choice except uh, in, in, in the family. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, Twitter politics and Twitter literature, that is contemporary, I agree. But I would like to ask you rather specific questions about how you work. Since I'm writing uh, myself and humbly, I'm not uh, pretentious to whatever, but still I know what does it mean. For instance, um, you, for, for each book, you have more than 1,000 interviews, and then you choose mm -hmm. several hundred. What is the criteria? How do you choose? Uh, then also, it's, it's very interesting for me, because you meet uh, different people with different educational level, also with different language. The style of language is different. How do you keep that style? Do you keep uh, full authenticity, um, fully authentic, or do you clean it uh, a little bit to make it uh, more understandable for general reader? And then um, a, a question um, about structure. Do you structure your uh, book, uh, and then you fill that structure with interviews? or it vice versa, structure is born from the interviews, how you compose them together. And, and then um, how many pages of, uh, for one page of text, how many, not wasted pages, but not uh, uh, draft pages do you have? And last and most difficult question, you are writing horrible stories. How long they stay will be inside you, with you, and how you, you take the distance from that, because otherwise you would not be able to switch to another and to create another book. So that is many, many questions, but they are really professionally <laughs> very specific. Thank you. Well, I hope that I come across as an adequate person, that I am not uh, loony. Dear Sandra, to answer your question, I'll have to answer my entire life. Well, it's taken me a number of years to have lived it all, and now I need to tell you it all. It's a tall order. I remember I saw a movie recently. It was a movie about Tchaikovsky, the composer. So the director showed Tchaikovsky writing a symphony, running around his apartment, creating his music. Of course, it's a terrible representation of the artistic process. Of course, intuition plays an important part, but I'll outline it for you in stages. For instance, right now I'm working on a book about love. Why did I choose this subject? Because I'm interested in how our people now live with, in the absence of an idea, because our culture can be characterized as a culture based on struggle, a fight. So what's this exit strategy for this culture? What is a private life nowadays? What is life per se? We never address the issue of happiness, but we hear all the time that people want to be happy, and they speak about happiness. So all these controversies, in my view, need to be addressed in a new way. I don't want to present just a story. Vanya fell in love with a girl, etc. Well, there have been millions of stories like that. So what I'm trying to identify is how to address this issue in a new way. What shall I present to the reader? What is new for today? At the same time, 
I'm telling the reader about our culture, about our life, about our understanding of how things are, and not just the first meeting, etc. But all this needs to be conveyed in an artistic form. But because I'm a writer who sticks to a documentary narrative, so I don't give last names for my characters. In the book about love, last names don't count, be it Ivanov, Petrov, Jones, etc. It doesn't matter. It's about feelings. But what is also clear to me is that today people would be interested in reading books, at least I would read a book, with a new representation, a new tonality, new hues of the same feeling, something that we may still be lacking in our culture, something that has emerged at the level of knowledge, because right now the entire world literature is open to people. The world is open as well. So I ask people, and I've already had about a thousand pages of two, three hundred interviews, so I've already spoken to all these people. And frankly, I don't know. Will I take anything from those pages? Because right now I'm still not sure about the concept, the general concept. I don't hear the music, the key tone for the book, and even the title is still a working title. So... Through the process, I need to find it all. Sometimes a story that I hear boils down to half a page, sometimes to a page, sometimes it's just two sentences. So in other words, I'm trying to portray the image of an age. What people of that age, for instance, could tell me about a war, about socialism, about communism, about love, I have another book where existential issues are addressed. So people of different ages, of different genders, of different elders, young people, all of them have their unique viewpoints. I bring together people who are 18 years of age and those who are in their 50s. Totally different approaches to love. Even first love. It's one thing when you describe it when you are 18, but at the age of 50, it's a totally different story when you recall what happened to you when you were 18. So human documents, they're all living documents because these are all versions, because what is reality? It's our memories of them. Reality per se does not exist. A human document is always a version. It's always something, a memory penetrated with feeling. So be it a happy life, be it a sad life, who you, li who you live with, what made you disappointed. So you really have to build it all together. So when I meet a person, I don't tell him directly, please tell me about the war in Afghanistan. No, we talk about life. So my interlocutor, a guy, he tells me about life and death. He tells me how he heard the shells bursting or the bullet missing him. And so he understood at that very moment that it just a sec he was a second away from death. It turned his hair gray, what he went through. Or when he f first saw a dead body. So when it comes to a book, you need to bring it all together. But when a person tells you a story, it's a creative act. Because... A person can never present him or herself objectively. It's just a mission impossible. Even if somebody asks you about what you saw today, everybody would have their own version. Because what you hear, what you see, is put on top of who you are. So I'm always trying to portray, to imagine this elements with all the hues and colors and then I hear it all 
and I need to organize it, to systemize it in such a way that, after all, you can call it art, literature. So it's really difficult to tell you how it's done. I've told you what I could, but I'm not sure that I've outlined the entire process. Perhaps some people from the audience have questions. Okay. Um, yes, I see that people, people, people have mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I try to find you. Um, I see one, two, three men, no woman. <laughs> ah, <laughs> oh. thank you. <laughs> so we start here in, in front, please. And uh, I collect uh, three questions, and uh, then we go to the answer, or you want mm -hmm. uh, to answer question by Давайте question? How about we answer each question individually? Because when I hear a question, there is some emotion that I feel, and then it may just disappear. Svetlana Alexandrovna, I am a big fan of yours. And when you published the book, The War, The Womanly Face of War, I was 14, 15, and my parents read it, and I was really shaken by that book. I still remember that feeling. And I was always wondering, you seem to be very sensitive, and at the same time you keep going, because you wrote this book, Time Second Hand. And I can tell you from my own experience that over the last several days, you know, know about this interview, scandalous interview, because I used to be a journalist for 20 years, and I know that in an interview you could make a hero out of a person and at the same time destroy him or her completely. But my question to you is, why did it happen to you? And once again, thank you so much for coming here today, and thank you so much for your sincerity, for your honesty, and for your books. I'll tell you what. When it comes to Russia, All the Nobel Prize winners are guilty for having been awarded the prize. Take Bunin as a case in point. He was called a dog. Take Pasternak. He hid away from everybody at his dacha, except for Sholokov. Sholokov was pro-Stalin. So... That's one factor. But also, when I went to Russia last time, I actually didn't want to go there. I knew that today it's a different Russia. It's not the Russia I love. The people are still there whom I love, but the Russia, the country itself, is different. As uh, writer Ludmila Ulitska says, my country is sick. It has fallen sick today. I didn't want to go there, but my publisher told me, well, look, you tour Europe, you tour the world, and you don't go to Russia. So I went there, I went to the Gogol Center, and the audience was vast, about 700 people at the Alexandrinsky Theater. I was not allowed to, and actually film director Sakurov and theater director Dodin couldn't take the stage there either, but the director of the Hermitage, Mr. Piotrovsky, he offered a stage at the Hermitage, and there were a lot of people there. And I saw many people crying who couldn't enter the room. And I understood that they were crying not because we were so great. Their tears were due to despair. They just wanted to hear people whom they love, whom they trust. They wanted to hear how to go on living what could be their guideline. And I understand, I could empathize with them, I understand what it's all about. And of course, I was asked a lot what my attitude is vis-à-vis -vis the war in Ukraine. When I'm in Moscow, I always tell them, honestly, look, I think the Crimea has been annexed, and the Donbass area, there were a lot of problems there. 
But before Russia intervened, there had been no slaughter. And there are memoirs of Mr. Strelkov, who took a group of people there who was supposed to start all the unrest there. And Mr. Strelkov confesses himself that the most difficult thing was to make those Russians who came with them to start shooting. So people were not ready. People were not willing to shoot at others. And as I said, had it been not for the presence of Russian troops and Russian contractors and Russian weapons, the people themselves would have resolved this issue in a totally different way. There could have been argument, there could have been movements towards some kind of federation. There were a lot of civilized options. But nobody seems to dare to speak out loud about that anymore today. So Kiselov, Solovyov, those who run the federal channels in Russia. So Mr. Kiselov, for instance, said that Alexeyevich shouldn't be thinking that the Nobel Prize is her protective charter. We've broken people even stronger than her. So I think that the presidential elections are upcoming in Russia. Putin has cleansed the electoral field, so he thinks that his, he has television under control. If you look at the newspapers, well, they're all pro-Putin. But now they are tackling the artistic dimension, starting with directors. There is an director, Kirill Serebrenikov, and they're pr prosecuting him because people like this, free artists, they are not needed by the state the way it is in Russia now. They are not needed by the church. They are not needed by the time, per se. But it doesn't mean that we have to give up and be silent. But I realized how difficult it is for those who live in Russia now and want to be honest, want to be honest in their thinking and in their words. I know how teachers lost their jobs just because in their classroom they said that they support Ukraine or that they disagree with Putin. In other words, I realized that it is really difficult to survive when you are basically buried with all this dirt. And what is more, this splashes of hatred in Facebook, those troll factories. And there are a lot of people who are full of hatred. They feel humiliated, they feel robbed. And of course, it's very easy to redirect their hatred in, towards the enemy of the people as we are labeled by Mr. Putin, national traitors, the traitors of the people. We live in a besieged fortress. It's like back in the 30s. So there is no wonder that's what is happening now. All right. That's my answer to your question. Kolikov asks, Mr. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Igor Kokolak. I'm the head of the Association of Ukrainians in Belgium. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to listen to you, Ms. Alexeyevich and Ms. Harms. Thank you for making it possible. <clears throat> so my question is this. In your book, Second Hand Time, you split well, we split the book in two parts. First, from 91 to 2001, and the second to, from 2002 to 2012. If you were to write the book now, would you add the third part, starting in 2013, after all the events in Ukraine? And if so, in your opinion, what would be the thoughts of the Russian people now about it? Thank you. Well, you know, a lot of people believe in what mass media, Rus the Russian mass media is is saying. It's a very primitive tool, but it's very efficient. This tool is, is uh, used uh, or is being targeted at a very strange 
type of, of audience, strange mentality. For several days I've been trying as a, as a professional, as a master of the word, I was trying to watch the Russian TV and I felt sick because they were using all those images of uh, crucified uh, Russian soldiers, of all these refugees that have been tortured and uh, abused. But uh, on the contrary, when... Um, when all those villages are, are, are invaded, or when, when the, the paramilitary, the militia arrives at, the, at those villages, they find cellars uh, with people hiding there in terrible state. But it is clear when there is war, when there is a war going on, as one a wise person told me, if a person took a machine gun in his hands, this person will turns into a, a monster. War is a different environment, in a different, entirely different world. Men, women uh, are no longer themselves. Uh, even in Kabul, uh, when I was there for several months, when you see a dead body, a murdered or killed person, something happens to you. Uh, when I was told that, oh, there was a famous singer who came before you to us and she took a machine gun, made a few shorts, and uh, it was great, she liked it, but I couldn't do it when I was offered a chance. I didn't want to uh, experience that. I didn't want to touch that instrument of murder. Uh, another question? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the name is Traian Ungureanu. I'm a Romanian MEP, um, the EPP group. Thank you for being there and thank you for your deeply humane uh, literature. And also thank you to Mrs. Harms for organizing this uh, event. And by the way, can I politely ask you to refrain from coloring Chernobyl green? It's red. It's deeply red. Uh, now, speaking about ruins, can I ask uh, Svetlana Alexeyevich, isn't it a bit too early to speak about ruins? In other words, I want to know what do you think of the renewed love affair between the young Western generations and the socialist ideas, even it, in its extreme forms? And again, about ruins, can I ask you what do you think about Nord Stream, Nord, Nord Stream 2? Is it easier to build through the ruins of socialism? Thank you. You see, I'm not a politician, and you are the politicians. You, are, you, you, you have this political spirit around you. What I can say is that uh, communism is a, a permanent... Uh, uh, in, eternal um, companion of uh, a man and in what form it is present in France or in other European uh, countries uh, in other uh, human or industrial or governmental relations it, it is present but in a different form in some IT forms it, <laughs> when Pliham when Plehamov was saying you can't jump from um, capitalism into socialism in one go, you have to pass through certain stages. That was Plehanov's ideas. I, I wouldn't say that socialism is being um, resurrected. I would say that um, imperialistic ideas are currently being disseminated and promoted that's what Putin is aiming at. When, um, when Russia was making a lot of money from selling its oil, nobody could understand where the money went to, where the, this money was, because they were nowhere to be found or seen. And Putin likes to repeat that, the best, that Russia's best friend are, friends are army and excellent weapons. Medieval ideals, medieval thinking, but this is the way of thinking of those who have the power in their hands. 
And uh, the question is how to resist that. As for the young people and as for the brainwashing that the young people are being subjected to, and whether it's uh, effective or not, what I can say is that even in the Soviet times, people were better educated than now. You see, being able to speak several languages is not yet a mark of your education. You have to know many more things than just being able to speak a foreign language. When I met young people, well-traveled uh, and uh, well-spoken, but those young people are so, so pro-Putin, it's frightening to hear them speak. And this idea of imperialist, of the empire, of the imperialist glory, it's very strong, the idea of an empire, of a strong empire. It is strong. It is being promoted. And Russia remains a great empire with many colonies. And all those uh, countries, Bashkarstan, Tatarstan, the countries, the areas with many different nationalities, they are subjugated, they're subjected to Russia's rule. The time is such that uh, you can expect practically anything. I've met many powerful people, uh, many officials, and to those people characterize Putin as a weak man. And I ask them why? Because, because he didn't let us go as far as Kiev. Why? Because Kiev is the heart of uh, the the heart of Russia, and it is impossible to talk to a person because this person is very, very deeply affected by this false mythology, and people are. Um, start uh, writing reports, people tell on each other, they start write reports on misdeeds of other people. You bought, somebody bought wrong kind of cigarette, somebody said something wrong or something that seemed suspicious. Uh, to say it here, uh, I think uh, the task is uh, that the Europeans uh, are able to stop uh, the Germans, especially the Germans, who still think that Nord Stream 2 is a kind of friendship project, uh, very, very important for Russians, always forgetting mm -hmm. that all the money Russia is making with oil and gas is... Uh, not arriving uh, to help uh, citizens uh, out of second-hand time feeling. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I saw um, three ladies, no, 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 no men anymore, we have time for three <laughs> questions, and I saw three women before, and uh, now I see two. Um, now I see again three. So we start in the back. Yes, you, please. Hello, my name is Isadora. I'm an admirer of your work. Reading Voices of Chernobyl was a heartbreaking, profoundly thought-provoking experience. So thank you very much for your amazing work. My question is, as an artist who writes about the suffering of others, do you face any ethical challenges? What's your responsibility towards your characters? Thank you. Indeed, it's true. Uh, I will give you one example to be brief. It is a very complicated question. Why? I remember uh, there was a, a court case against my book, Boys in Zinc, uh, 
and uh, of course I, I, I had no such purpose as to slander the Russian army so I had to show up for the hearings uh, at first there is some investigative stage uh, and so when I came to the court uh, I saw a woman there and uh, I remembered this woman from uh, I was introduced to her to this lady when uh, um, when this woman received a zinc coffin with the remains of her son and uh, when I uh, went to the court uh, there was this woman and this lady worked on the railway station and so this uh, old woman was there and this lady was urging me please please tell them the whole truth please I I bore a son, and I was counting on him to be by my side until the end of my life. So I raised my child, um, and I loved him. So this uh, young man was conscripted, and uh, he wasn't supposed to be drafted in the army because he was the only son, and he already had some education, basic uh, vocational training. But he was still drafted. And uh, before he was sent uh, to, in, into action, he was fixing something at some general's dacha, country house. And, of course, this boy couldn't, didn't learn uh, to shoot or throw grenades and he was killed within the first month of his service and this lady was urging me please please tell them the truth and so this lady in the court during the court hearings was actually sitting among the um, witnesses of accusation and I asked her what are you doing here I never needed a son who was a traitor I wanted to see my son a hero. This is what was what this lady told me in um, in the court, and I was shocked by that. Another example uh, is uh, about the Chernobyl disaster. One of the stories relates the last moments before the death of one of the liquidators, and his wife uh, was telling me how her husband eventually. Uh, was um, basically dying, how his body was deteriorating and r rotting. And, her, um, and so her account goes as follows. For two hours he was silent. Uh, it was difficult to, find, to give him painkillers. Uh, we didn't have any painkillers. And for two hours during the night he was silent. And we were making love. We were making love in this time, but I can't tell anyone about it because I would be considered a pervert. But I, we, we did make love, and I just had to do it with my eyes closed, remembering him as this beautiful young man who I married. And when I, in, uh, and when I added this account, this story, t to my book, I changed. I had to change her last name. I had to do it because I didn't want to see her. Um, attacked by people who would accuse her of necrophilia, of perversion, and all sorts of sexual crimes. And you can imagine how my surprise, my astonishment, when this lady called me on the phone a few days later and asked me, Svetlana, why did you change my name? Why, did you, uh, why didn't you publish it under, you know... Well, Ludmila, I wanted to save you, protect you from any negative reaction. It was such, a, was such an amazing thing you did, and I wanted to protect you. Not everybody can understand that. No, told, she told me, please add my name to it. I've suffered so much. He suffered so much. Please put my name under this story. You see how difficult to deal with. With, with this truth. Some people can bear it and they're prepared to take the consequences. They're prepared to bear the burden of that truth, no matter how terrible it is. Other people ask to change their names. Other people change their mind altogether, entirely. 
A human being is a living person. It's a living organism. It changes. A, it is subject to all sorts of transformations, and you have to take it all into account. Of course, I had many troubles in my life, but I always tried to convince myself that I'm trying to be defending good. I do not collect horrors. I do not collect cases of evil. I collect the resilience, the cases of strength and examples of strength of human spirit, of human resilience, of forbearance. But a human being is a very, very changeable thing, as Tolstoy used to say. The round for women. <laughs> yeah, it's you. It's you. It's you. Thank you very much. That was the most inspiring things that I have ever heard. Thank you. Thank you for the truth that you are not afraid of telling to the rest of the world. Well, my question may come across as a pragmatic and ideology-based. You've mentioned some representatives of the younger generation who are on the crossroads between the Eastern and Western countries. And where shall these young people go? They speak two, three foreign languages. They've been educated in Europe. They've lived through the European values of freedom and democracies and truth. So where shall they go with their knowledge and languages if they are not actually wanted in their country? I'll tell you what, it's a very personal question. But I believe that if you are from Ukraine, you go back to Ukraine. And if you are from Belarus, well, you need to prepare for a new age. It will come. Unfortunately, we don't live that long to be waiting for it forever, but I believe that when it comes to Belarus, it's really very difficult to use all the knowledge and to preserve all the qualities that you've er, learned to appreciate here. But when it comes to your life, I think it's important to be on the side of good as much as possible. And when it comes to choices, and life presents you with a choice on a daily basis, well, perhaps you should have this as your kind of guideline. So I opt for the good. I opt for truth. So these are eternal questions, and you just need to give answers to them. I promised uh, one more woman from there. Yeah, it's you. Bonjour. D'abord, merci pour. Good evening. Well, thank you very much for your contribution and thank you very much for your books. I have uh, read your book, War, the Unwomanly Face of War, and you're saying often, you repeat often, that you try to listen with sensitivity, but using reason, you are trying to listen without any a priori, you're trying to understand the truth, to hear the truth. When I read your books and when I listen to you tonight, my impression is that there is no separation between that sensitive word, domestic word, and the historic word. It is us making the difference. That's how I feel tonight. We should stop putting a separation wall between the various words. It's not that we have words on the one hand and big values, big ideas on the others. That's what I feel tonight when I listen to what you say. Would you agree with this? Would you agree that we should not distinguish between the two? Does that sound consistent to you? Does that sound coherent? I believe that 
if you meant this conflict between the heart and the mind, I think they need to go hand in hand. Because without your heart, you won't be able to do anything. You can't approach a person just in cold blood, with cold mind, but this person is telling you, like in my book about Chernobyl, when a woman told me about giving birth to a girl who was a disabled child who died very quickly after that. So she kept repeating, I wish she had even fingers, because she had just four fingers, but she's a girl. She's a baby girl. See, this is the horror that the mother experienced, and this is really horrific. So imagine me being a cold-minded person. No, of course not. I know a lot, and I've learned a lot through my books, but still, I believe that I've remained a very amicable person. I like people, and I know a lot of things that I wouldn't want to know, but still. But I don't want to talk about it. How did you manage to bear it all? When I was 35, my, uh, uh, my sister was dying. And I saw how surgeons worked, a woman surgeon. I saw her work. And sometimes I talked to her. So she took me along when she treated patients. And I didn't want to go back home because once I go home, I will immediately come back to the hospital. So I saw this surgeon interacting with mothers of sick children on a daily basis. The same thing, you need to tell the mother or the father that this, your child has so much time left. So once I've gone through that, I cannot tell you that a writer is a very special being. Although I've been to a war line, I've been in court, I've been trialed, but can you imagine how it feels when you need to face parents on a daily basis and tell them this terrible truth? And then you go to, back to the wards and see these angelic faces of the children and know their fate. So I think questions like this, they are incorrect vis-à-vis -vis life per se. Because there are a lot of professions with... A, certain percentage of risk, be it a military person or a surgeon. There are a plethora of professions where you need to take risks. Literature, at least the literature I'm writing, also has an element of risk in it. And so when I was in Afghanistan during the war, I found out that there were a lot of women, women military journalists, and I saw women who were in the front line. They were attacking the enemy. I wouldn't do that. And then they told me when we met in the West, because there we were on the opposite sides of the barricade, as it were. And uh, many people risk their lives for the sake of their jobs, so to say that this is something very special, unique to my profession? No, I wouldn't say so. And the more serious you are about your work, you understand how little you can actually say, how little you can actually do, and how short your lifespan is. So, I'm not a young person, but I've written just five books, because what I write, they are not quick because it takes seven to ten years to write a book for me. So each book is a part of my life. But I can tell you that, as Bunin used to say, life is wonderful, admirable, but horrific at the same time. But you always remember that it's all you have. It's the only thing you have.
So thank you very much, uh, Svetlana, that you invested a day uh, to talk with us in Brussels. We saw you on several occasions, and I think also in the name of the audience, um, uh, I can tell you uh, that we very, very much appreciate your books and that we very much appreciate that you allowed us to see a bit uh, the woman and the writer behind your books and we promise uh, that we will do our utmost to be on the good side with you. Thank you.